Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the Science Coordinator for the partnership. And today uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Gail Morris with us. Gail is the coordinator of the Southwest Monarch Study, which is a partner with the Monarch Joint Venture and the co-author of the recently published Status of Deneus Plexippus in Arizona. Gail is also a Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist and Vice President of the Monarch Butterfly Fund Board of Directors. Gail is going to present to us today. Uh, the title of her webinar is Deneus Plexippus in the Southwest, Opening the Treasure of New Insights about Monarch Butterflies in the Desert. This webinar is being hosted by one of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative critical management question teams. Our team number four is looking at uh, the physiological impacts of climate change on species. And so that's one of the things uh, that Gail is going to be talking to us about today is the impact of climate change on the species, but also some other new insights about the species in the Southwest. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today and especially thank uh, Gail Morris for sharing her work with us. And now I'm going to turn it over to you, Gail. Well, thank you, everyone. I am very grateful for your interest in joining us today. Uh, I have a lot to share with you, and much of the information will be based on the paper uh, that we recently have published. I will give you a link to that at the end of the presentation, so if you're interested, you could read more details. We also have uh, a shorter version called the Top 10 Key Findings in case if you don't want to go through 19 pages of information. So let's jump in. And one of the things we will be doing today is looking at some of the changing information about population maps and migration that has evolved over the last 10 to 15 years. Okay. And for some reason, I am not able to progress through my slides. So oh. can you try the? Okay. Can you try the? There you Back go. A little Great. Bit. <laughs> my scary moment as a presenter. All right. This was, uh, as you can see, a map uh, from Journey North uh, about 10 years ago that was very uh, common on their uh, website. It is a wonderful reporting. Uh, opportunity to report uh, not only monarch absence presences in different parts of the United States, but other things as well. And I, I highly recommend you look at their uh, website. But you can see in this website uh, view that it was very clear that there were two populations in this um, map. We had the eastern population, which was well known to go to the overwintering sites in Mexico, and those in the west. Uh, that went to coastal Arizona, uh, California. And you could see that both Arizona and New Mexico and parts of the western states were not considered breeding areas at that time. Monarchs in the east fly down to Mexico. You can see the huge numbers adorning trees in the area. And by February, usually they are breaking up and starting to fly in the area. It's a wonderful sight to see. The numbers in Mexico, of course, we've been hearing about much in the news, are very concerning. Uh, after highs in the 1996-97, we know insect populations go up and down normally, but as you can see on the far right, this last winter's population was only the second highest uh, in this region recorded time. Along the California coast, there's over 300 sites. Uh, they stretch from near San Francisco all the way down the Baja Peninsula in northwestern Mexico. These are usually dense wooded areas dominated by eucalyptus trees, Monterey pines, and Monterey cypresses. This was a, a great cluster in the Golita area outside of Santa Barbara. And if you ever have the opportunity to visit these sites, it's a, a wonderful experience. They number from 50,000 to under 10 each year. Some are large sites. Some are what we call transitional sites. The monarchs will move in in one area and then continue on near the coast. So those are our two major 
overwintering areas for monarchs in the United States. But as you can see, their numbers have also lowered, although the last couple years the population has more leveled, uh, but they are not seeing the higher numbers that they once did in the late 1990s. So for a little bit of history of what was happening at the time, there were many local uh, lepidopterists in Arizona and butterfly enthusiasts that were in the field, like Jim Brock and Rich Bailwood, who noticed southerly flight of monarchs back in the 1990s. Uh, Rick Gilmore noted monarchs flying west through mountain passes along I-40 going into California. Uh, we also have documentation of over 150 monarch sightings around Arizona in the 1970s and 80s. Around 1995, uh, Dr. Robert Pyle came through while he was researching his book on chasing monarchs. He observed monarch butterflies flying through the Rocky Mountain passes. Um, monarchs in the West, he felt, also seemed to follow rivers. Not, they weren't wedded to the rivers, but when they could, they st stayed near moist areas before they would break away on a, a southerly or westerly trajection, depending on where they were. And he started raising questions, as others have over time, uh, is there really a separate East and West monarch population? When he visited Arizona, he noted that monarch butterflies were flying in a southerly direction heading into October. Uh, monarch Watch at that point updated their maps reflecting his sightings of southerly flight through Arizona. And also, if you could notice, that included parts of New Mexico as well. There's more questions that started coming up. Dr. Lincoln Brower and Dr. Bob Pyle noted that wind shifts during the spring migration resulted in higher populations in the West the following fall. Uh, Dr. Robert Vandenbosch also did a study looking at NABA counts during the summer that reflected a similar observation, that there seemed to be an influx in the West when in the fall after there was a strong spring migration in the east. Later in 2012, there was a genetic study that indicated that they formed one admixed population. There was not a western monarch population that was distinct from the east. Around 2003, Chris Klein initiated a study of the migration in the southwest beginning mainly in Arizona. He uh, moved to Cal uh, Ohio in 2009 uh, and resigned from the study in two January of 2010. We reorganized at that time. Uh, the study then expanded to include monarch breeding habitats and conservation. We've become a joint partner with Monarch Joint Venture. At this time, I've been coordinating the study since that time. So let's go through a very quick overview of monarchs versus other butterflies that are often confused from them. Uh, on the upper left, you can see the monarch butterfly. And right to the right is the queen butterfly. They're both in the Dineas family. Um, and you can see the similar markings. Note with the queen butterfly having the white dots in the orange. Very frequently, these two are confused. Uh, we frequently receive sightings of queens that are mistaken as monarchs. Because they are in the Dineas family, they both share milkweed as a host plant. And so often we'll see both larvae on milkweed plants. On the lower left is the painted lady. Um, very frequently we receive reports of baby monarchs. Uh, usually they are uh, the painted lady migration coming through. We're happy people are outside noticing. And on the lower right, we have the Arizona Southwestern Viceroy, um, again, which is a mimic. Uh, you can see in this particular Viceroy, depending on where you live in the United States, it may look a little different. Besides the lower ridge of uh, black lines, there are also white dots uh, indicating the Viceroy in the Southwest is actually a mimic of the queen, uh, but often seen in similar habitats as the monarch and queen. Monarch larvae, 
monarch caterpillar on the left, monarch queen uh, caterpillar on the right. You can see the monarch on the left has two sets of tentacles, one in each end. The queen on the right has three sets of tentacles. They both will use only milkweed as host plant, uh, so you may see them. Now, what's an easy way to remember that if you're not familiar with the differences? Uh, we always tell our people in the field, M comes before queen, two comes before three. Look at the number of tentacles, the colorations of the white, uh, yellow and black are similar in both species, uh, although they're in different distributions. They also respect, res uh, will change the coloration in respect to temperature. As you can see here on the upper left um, is a monarch caterpillar in the Phoenix area when it was 106 degrees. They put on their light colors uh, when they molt. On the right, you can see a more common looking set of uh, monarch larvae. And on the lower left is when it's really cold, uh, we, when we found some winter breeding, and they have very dark colors to absorb as much heat as they can. On the left is a male monarch. On the right is the female, so you can tell the difference in the field. The right female has thicker veins, as you can see. That's all relative if you only have one monarch in front of you. Uh, on the left, you can see on the lower wing, there is a black dot. It is a alar dot uh, indicating a male. Um, it's usually the third vein from the abdomen. And often monarchs, when they're feeding, will open their wings, and that's easy to see. There's other ways to tell the difference as well. That is one of the most easily identifiable. So the importance of Asclepias, or milkweed. Unlike other butterfly species that may have many host plants, Monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweed. And when larvae feed on milkweed, they absorb the cardinaloids, which makes both the caterpillar and the future adult butterfly distasteful to predators. They're considered to have warning coloration as an adult with their orange colors or as a larvae with their white, yellow, and green. Asclepius. There are over 108 species of Asclepius in North America, and monarchs use approximately 30 as a host plant that we've identified. And Arizona is only second to Texas in the numbers of species. Uh, and of course, you can find these on the USDA databases as well as SciNet. Besides a host plant for both monarchs and queens, they are also the number one nectar plant, as you can see, for many pollinators. It's a rich source of nectar. In Arizona, there's five climate zones that were identified by Davison in 1999. For the purpose of our study, we merged them into three because of similarities in plant species. And we identified them as the low and mid de deserts, the high deserts and cool plateau highlands, and the high mountainous regions. And you'll hear me refer to these uh, throughout this discussion. We went through and we identified the species of Asclepius most favored by monarch butterflies in the state. We looked at all our elevations, and you can see in this chart that we identified several as the primary by elevation, but we also identified those that are evergreens. Most milkweeds across the United States will emerge in the spring, flower, and then senesce in the fall and die back, so they are not available for any monarch breedings if there were monarchs in the area. However, in Arizona and some southwestern states, and we'll share some of those in the next few slides, there are some that are evergreens that stay green year round, or at least those that are in the deserts. A few of them, when they're in the higher elevations, may lose their leaves and then uh, rebloom in the spring. Asclepia subverticillata was noted as our number one monarch host plant across the state. Uh, this is also available in many of the southwestern states. It's in New Mexico, Colorado, um, and the Utah area. Um, it is also known as horsetail milkweed, also as poison milkweed. It has a very high cardinaloid uh, load, uh, which protects the monarchs well. It spreads not only by seeds, but by underground rhizomes. As you can see, it's on highway uh, 
uh, GIPS, it's, and probably it's located more in the higher elevations and mid elevations in Arizona, frequently where we see Arizona um, monarchs during the breeding season. Showy milkweed is only available in Arizona in the highest elevations, just uh, in limited areas in the mid elevations. But it is probably one of the most common milkweeds in the entire western United States, uh, as well as the higher southwest areas. Uh, frequently, the reports of monarch breeding from New Mexico uh, come in on showy milkweed. Antelope horns uh, was frequently uh, cited throughout the state at all elevations. Mojave milkweed, uh, Sclepius nictaginifolia, some of these in the lower deserts will die back during the summer months. Uh, but those of us who are uh, living in the area affected by the summer monsoons, if we have abundant rains, there will be a rebirth in the spring and uh, later in the fall. Butterfly weed, you'll notice uh, we have uh, more of the yellow than the orange or any darker colors in the southwest. Uh, the yellow is usually more drought tolerant. While it is not known as the uh, most used uh, milkweed for a monarch egg laying, it is still abundant around the state and a great nectar source. It is used, I want to be clear on that, just not as much as other milkweeds. Engelman's milkweed as well was used by monarchs. Uh, Erosa milkweed, um, desert milkweed, also is very common along the Colorado River, um, but also in the mountains outside of the, in the Rincon Mountains, uh, where we would see uh, monarchs. Uh, larvae. Interestingly, we weren't sure of the use of the vining milkweeds in Arizona, but this last fall, Jim Brock in Tucson sent his photos of monarch larvae using them um, in the late uh, fall period. So they seem to be used not as a regular uh, plant, but they are definitely uh, been observed. These are some of our evergreen milkweeds. Uh, Pine leaf milkweed, Asclepia flinaria, is primarily in Arizona, limited in New Mexico, and only in one county in central Arizona. It is not a major um, use as a host plant, but as you can see on the right, larvae are noted from time to time. Arizona milkweed is only in Arizona. Uh, all of these evergreen milkweeds, by the way, extend their range all the way down into Mexico. So while I'm saying it's only in these limited states, there is a southern extension. This is probably one of the most favored milkweeds where it's available. Um, we almost always see uh, monarchs responding to this one. Subulata has been probably one of our biggest surprises in most of the studies around uh, the West. Uh, this hasn't even been mentioned as a host plant. And yet in the southern deserts, along Ajo, along the Colorado River, the Phoenix area, and in the Tucson area, where it's used often as a landscaping plant, we frequently observe monarch larvae uh, on these plants. They, when they are having their growth period, they uh, have soft, furry growth that usually the, legs, the eggs are laid on, as well as on the flowers. This is an interesting, Asclepias latifolia was not on our list, uh, but I wanted to share some information about it because I know it's being grown for seed as part of the seed restoration. In Arizona, we frequently see large amounts of ants on this plant. Uh, there seems to be a lot of honeydew with uh, aphids on this, which are attracted to all milkweed by far. But this plant almost always has large amounts of ants, and we have not been able to find monarch caterpillars on them. So I'll be interested in uh, hearing your experiences about that, since it uh, has its range throughout the Southwest. Okay, very quickly, the monarch life cycle. Uh, they mate when they're four to five days old. Uh, usually you'll see them uh, tussle on the ground like you can on the left. Uh, they'll usually fly to a tree. Um, usually mating time is in the afternoon, uh, but if they haven't seen a member of the opposite sex for a long time, anything can happen any time of day. Uh, females usually begin laying eggs the next day, and the eggs will typically hatch in about four days. 
eggs are small. They're usually on the underside of a leaf, and we put a little arrow here for you could, to see their size in comparison to aphids and other uh, creatures that are on that leaf. There is a myth that they only lay one egg per plant. In an ideal situation, that would probably happen. But in a time of declining milkweed patches, sometimes we observe other behavior. What we can say is that they do only lay one egg at a time. They do not lay clusters of eggs at one moment. Um, you can see on the left a photo posted by Monarch Watch many years during the drought uh, when monarchs bypassed Texas and continued to move north. You could see the large number of eggs on this plant. Now remember, photos can be deceiving. This is only two to three inches tall. Um, so the chances of survival uh, when the caterpillars emerge are, are very small. And on the right, you can see three larvae on that plant. So you will often see, especially in areas with small numbers of milkweed plants, you have that opportunity to see large numbers of larvae as well. Uh, when the egg is laid on the upper left, then Within a couple of days, you'll notice a little black tip on it, like in the center photo. And that is actually the head of that caterpillar that will emerge on the top right. On the lower left, you can see as that larva gets bigger, it's starting to uh, form uh, holes in the plants. And that's often some of your first signs, the skeletonizing of leaves, the chewing of leaves. And on the right, you can see as they get bigger, their heads emerging. Caterpillars can eat and grow rapidly. They can increase the rate almost 3,000 times in 10 to 15 days. They remain in the larval state for approximately 9 to 14 days. It's all temperature driven. Uh, finally, they will often leave that plant, although they can stay on the plant, as you can see in this lower left photo, and form what we call a J shape, which will eventually turn into a chrysalis on the right panel. Uh, they will remain as a chrysalis from 9 to 15 days. Again, it's all temperature sensitive. We'll change that in a minute so you can see how that looks uh, before it turns clear and that beautiful monarch butterfly closes. Now, in the West, the tension we have with this is many of our climates are very dry. And so our nighttime temperatures can plummet quite low while the days are very warm. And that could be affecting this cycle by the time of the year. Um, we are not going to stay on this. There's no final test. But I did want you to know uh, that there is a science behind how long this time period takes, uh, about degree days, uh, how we need to, the most active growth occurs between about 53 degrees Fahrenheit and approximately 91. And they need to stay within those ranges for a certain amount of time before they can progress to the next stage. So uh, again, nothing uh, to get caught in here, just to be aware it exists. Uh, monarchs cannot fly before 50 degrees. They can withstand freezing temperatures for a very short period of time. And 108 degrees appears to be the upper larval limit uh, for survival for the monarch larvae, uh, according to lab studies. Female monarchs can lay approximately 300 to 500 eggs in their lifetime, an amazing number when you think about it. But look at the amount of predation. Only about 5% of those will make it to an adult. And on the right, you can see a beautiful photo submitted by one of the people that joined us on a tagging trip of a monarch egg where you can see the clear ridges. And just keep in mind how small they really are. Some of these predators, cachinid flies on the left, uh, that often will uh, lay their eggs in the caterpillar. And you can see uh, the pupae dropping out on the upper right, uh, assassin bugs. On the lower right, while this is not a monarch larvae, a reminder that wasps frequently uh, attack uh, larvae of all species and are a major predator. In addition, there are ants um, and many others uh, that attack both the eggs, the larvae, pupae, and sometimes even adult butterflies. From March through about August, the lifespan of a monarch is only two to five weeks. Monarchs that emerge from a chrysalis in late summer or fall delay reproducing, and they are in diapause. Uh, 
so their maturation at that point stalls. That allows the monarch to use the energy that they would normally use for reproduction for migration. A migration nectar will be a key to their successful migration on the way. The energy saved is also used for this migratory generation to live all winter up to nine months. So we have our breeding monarchs that live approximately a month and that migrating generation, which does not breed, that can live up to nine months. Interestingly, migrating monarchs can have almost double the weight of a non-migrator, and you can often see that in the field with their very fat abdomens. Migration begins near August 15th in Winnipeg, Canada, on the east. We're not too far away from that right now, are we? Uh, when monarchs begin showing directional flight to the south and southwest, and as they fly, they pick up other monarchs, so in the east, it can appear like a wave or by the time they hit the central United States. But what's happening in the West is less well understood, as you can see by this map. And that was what led to the study, to try to understand what is really happening here, and where are they going, where are they coming from, uh, what things trigger migration, is decreasing day length, the sun angle, what is the angle of the sun on new, at noon on a given day, seems to be one of the triggers uh, for the migration. Fluctuating temperatures, lower night temperatures, milkweed is finessing as the nights gets cold. Nectar also is starting to go into seed formation and dying back. So when does the migration begin? Dr. Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch would say, migration is correlated with sun angle the sun's elevation above the horizon at the solar noon, which is dependent on latitude and date. Uh, in the east, the migration would begin at a sun angle of 57 to 56, and 47 flows to a trickle, and here is your peak migration. These are a lot of numbers to remember, and there's, you know, it's a challenge for anyone to keep that in mind. So Monarch Watch made it very easy for you by going online. You can find the peak migration by latitude. By looking at your location, you can look up on this chart and get an idea of when the time is that you should see the most monarchs in your area. Um, and you can easily do that. We've pulled them out for Arizona to give you an idea and consider these lines extending across the southern United States um, to, to help get a, a bigger picture here. So in Flagstaff, the peak migration would be towards the end of September. You can see this movement south to Phoenix around the last days of September through early October, and finally Yuma and Tucson um, in early to mid-October. But here's the interesting thing. Nothing is very simple all the time because there's often a pre-surge of monarchs that arrives about one month before these peak abundance times. Um, sometimes I kind of like to look at this as a, a race, like we see at the Olympics. When that gun goes off and all the runners start, there's that main body of migrators, and that's reflected in this peak migration um, map. But there's always some that pull ahead, and there's always some laggers. And so those early ones we're going to see up to a month before. You can see in our results of our tagging map that surge that comes in, where we're seeing monarchs appearing in the breeding areas in Arizona. In uh, July, they start increasing as we start approaching September, and we get that big uptick of the pre-migrators coming in until the main migration hits at the beginning of October, and we surge upwards. These are some of the areas we've had activity uh, either tagging or sightings reported. Uh, um, we're going to hone in on Arizona, but I wanted to kind of give you the bigger amount of the areas that we are monitoring at this time. In Arizona, uh, wherever there is a green, uh, blue square tag, uh, we have either one or multiple tagging areas where there's been reported tags, whereas the red circles have been more than one sighting. The interesting thing about this is their location. And if you look closely, they're usually on rivers. 
Okay, so while they may not be large flowing rivers all the time, at some time of the year, there is usually a moisture source where we see the most monarchs present. By tagging approximately 12,088 monarchs by over 384 people, you can see uh, where they have flown. Contrary to earlier information, we actually have a split we have some of our monarch recoveries. A recovery means we tagged it in one spot, it was seen and recovered in another area. Uh, they were uh, visual, there was at least a visual observation of them in another area uh, that we have documentation for. So 23 of ours actually flew to Mexico from Arizona, um, 10 flew to California. Um, and one actually went from Nevada to California. Uh, you could see the one labeled E actually was from the Phoenix area and flew uh, to Kino Bay, Sonora, um, in December a couple of years ago. Uh, we also were part of a study by the Desert Botanical Gardens who uh, did a monarch program and imported farmed monarchs. Those uh, were tagged in the Phoenix area and released, and they flew down to the same overwintering sites in Mexico. There were five recoveries there. That program was completed several years ago. As a result, though, you can see the changes in the migration maps uh, put together by Monarch Watch that indicates some of our movement to California. Uh, I do want to uh, be clear that we don't know the path that these monarchs flew. There are several studies that show when monarchs hit the coast of California, if it is too warm, they will frequently fly north. So we have no idea did these monarchs go on a northwest trajectory from southeast Arizona or if they flew west and then uh, moved up the coast from there. But it still raised a lot of questions for us. Do we really have two migration destinations or uh, that were random, or was there some pattern? So I wanted to share from you uh, our sightings and recoveries of how they uh, came about. In 2008, there was one, 2010 one. Uh, in 2013, five flew to California, all tagged in the same week. Now keep in mind, all of these California recoveries were from southeast Arizona, uh, and last year there were three. Again, with that reminder, we don't know the actual flight path. Several of us, as, uh, as part of the Southwest Monarch Study, are uh, weather watchers for the National Weather Service. And we started noticing uh, the normally during the time when we were doing this tagging in Southeast Arizona, we were in a monsoon weather flow. Those of us who live here are aware a monsoon means a wind change. And instead of our prevailing westerly winds, the winds would shift and come from the southeast to the northwest or from east to west. This is a wind map from one of those days, September 13th. And if you can look on the lower part of Arizona, you could look at it actually beginning in El Paso, going through southern Arizona and leading all the way over to uh, California. You can see that wind flow going in that direction. So we contacted the National Weather Service to get data from Southeast Arizona, as many as we could, for the dates that were tagged in that area. And we noted the wind direction at 1,000 feet. Uh, the purpose for 1,000 feet was an earlier study by Dave Bebo, who showed that monarchs like to migrate around uh, and, and fly at thermals and fly around 1,000 feet. So we took that level. And on the upper left, where you could see NW, means winds were coming from the northwest. Uh, the gray dots are days that uh, we tagged monarchs. And you can see those big red dots were ones that were seen, were recovered in Mexico. Those from the southeast on the lower right, when the winds come from the southeast and blow to the northwest, you can see red dots that were recovered in California. So we found a, a significant finding, statistically significant, that wind direction uh, can predict uh, recoveries in which direction. We also had multiple recoveries on the same day. 
um, where we would have three or four monarchs tagged at one location that all went to either California or went to Mexico. Uh, by looking at that sun angle when they were tagged, we were able to find that most of our monarchs tagged in Arizona did go to Mexico during the peak migration, and those migration times are the green lines, and you can see those red triangles are recoveries in Mexico. Above that, the blue dots uh, were uh, recoveries in California uh, during the one month prior to that period when we were in a monsoon weather pattern. And the red triangles in that period were ones that flew to California when the wind shifted and went back to our normal uh, westerly pattern. There was a study, uh, actually several studies. This one was most recently published uh, by Baum and Mueller, that one month before the main migration, this movement south, those early migrators, many of them are breeders. They lay eggs, and as they're coming south, and then their offspring joins that main migration a month later. But our study is showing in that one month prior, some of them are indeed true migrators. We also found there are overwintering areas uh, in the southwest, in the Phoenix area, the Tucson area, along the Colorado River. These might exist in other southwestern states with riparian habitats. Uh, this was a former tire dump that they made into a wildlife oasis with reclaimed water. Uh, and you can see monarchs and queens nectaring in the area. Some of these, uh, this is an example of three areas where we've seen overwintering monarchs in the Phoenix area when a hard freeze hit. Uh, this one location at Rio Salado, uh, they were able to overcome the freezing temperatures and survive, whereas we lost the others. Uh, this area was restored with native uh, Asclepius subulata de, uh, desert milkweed, and that very first spring we were able to observe breeding, uh, monarchs laying eggs, and, and larvae. Interestingly, you could see the uh, monarch female laying eggs on that uh, subulata was one of the ones we tagged. We would tag them during the winter months to, to see how long the monarchs were staying in the area. We were also able to show that this particular location of monarchs frequently, it goes through reproductive diapause just like other uh, monarchs at the overwintering sites. Now this brings about a really interesting implication with climate change scenarios. If the temperatures warm and the overwintering numbers begin to increase in Arizona or the Southwest, will this hold true or will breeding be the more common situation where we still have a small number in diapause? These are unanswered questions for us to be thinking about. This particular location you could see on Earth Day, uh, the children work with local artists to uh, make photos on the river abundance uh, of creatures they see in the area, and you can see how they've added in the monarchs to the area. Okay, in regards to overwintering monarchs, it brings up a very interesting question that you've likely heard about across the United States um, that we've been beginning to explore here in the Southwest. That is uh, uh, obligate protozoan parasite that infects monarch and queen butterflies, OE. It must live within a host to grow and multiply, so uh, it, it is part of their life cycle. Uh, between infections, OE can even survive as spores that are resistant to extreme environmental conditions on plants. So when an infected monarch comes to feed on a plant, those spores can drop off. If it happens to be a milkweed, that caterpillar can come through and ingest them and become infected. There's a way to test for them. We can swipe the abdomens of the monarch uh, with a clear tape. Uh, we send ours into monarch health to be part of the national database, but oftentimes we look at them ourselves, of course, before we do so. Uh, but you can see the little green arrows. Those actually account for OE spores versus the larger that are the scales that are normal part of a monarch. Uh, there was a prediction by University of Georgia uh, that in the east there are less than 8% that have OE. 
the West 30% and non-migratory populations can be greater than 70%. So we were curious what would happen here in Arizona uh, that could be indicative of the Southwest as we start doing more testing. A lot of this is linked to migration length. The East has a longer migration, so unhealthy monarchs are kind of weeded out in the process. West has a smaller one, um, and so uh, there's less migrational demands on them. Uh, but you can also see those high numbers in uh, breeding populations. So we were wondering what would happen here with our wintering monarchs. There was a recent study that you've likely heard about by Satterfield et al. that was released earlier this year that pointed out that tropical milkweed frequently supports monarch breeding during the winter, whereas native milkweeds do so only in extremely rare circumstances. And the study took place in Texas and the coastal areas where it's naturalized. And you can see photos of this. Uh, milkweed here. In Arizona, we found that OE is very low, only about 4%. And do keep in mind that we have uh, uh, already have evergreen milkweeds here. So I talked to Dr. Sonia at Altizer, and she said prior to 2005, uh, with data from earlier years, OE prevalence was on the average about 30% of heavily infected monarchs based mostly on data from the uh, California overwintering sites. Since 2005, OE declined steadily, down to 3 to 4 percent by 2010. The decline in OE seems to mirror the decline in western monarchs and uh, also the long drought and loss of breeding habitat in the west. Uh, Cal Poly is currently doing a study, and in the breeding areas, mostly in backyard gardens, OE has been almost 100 percent. So we need more samples in the West. We've come up also with uh, breeding nectar that is important for monarchs on this list. Indian hemp, milkweed is almost always favored when it is available. Seep willow thistles, and we'll talk about those more later. Sunflower, alfalfa, uh, groundsel, clover, uh, and as, as well as some trees like the New Mexico vervain and, and lilac chase tree. Female monarchs will often lay eggs and milkweed is not yet in bloom, and so nectar is needed to be nearby until it does begin to bloom. There are native thistles, and as you can see here, monarchs are greatly attracted to them. I can't stress the importance of monarch migration nectar. We spent much time on the need for uh, milkweed, and that is critical uh, to future generations, but so is migration nectar, which has been declining. We created a list that's available on our study, uh, but the number one sources are sunflowers and rabbit brush, depending on the elevation. We can also find monarchs heavily using golden crown beard, asters, in the drier areas on sweetbush, Fabia gentia, and some of the senecios. Uh, you can see both queens and monarchs favor that. The dilemma of thistles is we know there are many invasive thistles in the southwest, um, but monarchs frequently during their migration will utilize them as a nectar source, and I've heard many discussions about removing them. I don't have the answer for you. Uh, yes, replace them with good nectar sources that our monarchs are known to use. However, do keep in mind you want to make sure they're really using them before you uh, do any thistle uh, of an invasive nature uh, removed. Uh, Biden's lava uh, forms rivers of uh, nectar for migrating monarchs. And due to our drought conditions, high temperatures in some areas, the numbers of these are decreasing. Uh, it would be wonderful if we can uh, take measures to try to increase the population of this important nectar plant. Sea willow along rivers. Uh, Sightings along the Grand Canyon were all along at Seep Willow uh, during the late October and November. Monarchs in water, they, in both California and Mexico, uh, during their overwintering period near the end of it, you'll always see monarchs going to, towards water as they become more dehydrated. But monarchs are not known as pug, puddlers during their breeding and migration period. 
But in the West, sometimes we'll see this activity, especially during periods of high temperatures and low humidity, which we know has been increasing the last few years. So these are the major threats, this, uh, loss of habitat, loss of milkweed, loss of nectar, grazing concerns, uh, roadside mowing, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, all of these have affected the monarch population. What is the prognosis? Increased droughts in the west, likely north and west of Arizona and New Mexico. The summer monsoon can likely help save these areas uh, with the amount of moisture we get. It's an unknown as to what degree. Increased El Nino weather conditions can benefit the southwest, but it can also devastate the overwintering sites. Uh, for example, back several years ago during a very dry spell in the overwintering sites, the monarchs uh, in Mexico moved further down the hill than they've ever been seen before because of the dryness uh, in the area. The water was not available in local rivers. Uh, they're usually near water sources for moisture, and so they did a movement shift to adapt to it. Uh, back in 2012, there was a six degree increase, uh, and monarchs, as a result, bypassed Texas and moved too far north uh, outside of the range of milkweed. Uh, there are many uh, threats that are unknown as well as ones that we're beginning to see. So what is the key to a successful restoration? Focus on locations, if you can, with seeps, sienegas, washes that can provide additional seasonal moisture leading to lush opportunity for large breeding grounds. Remember, a small breeding ground that helps with one or two monarchs in the area is good. If you could get 50 or more, it's even better. Remember the cornerstones of healthy monarch envir environments, trees or tall bushes, uh, for protection, milkweed, nectar for both breeding and migration, and a source of moisture. Uh, our seeps, our rivers should be cherished. Use Asclepius and spring and summer nectar that monarchs favor most first as a primary attractant. Uh, that was the large focus of this study. What milkweeds will monarchs cling to and be attracted to the most in a given environment? Remember migration nectar, that is crucial because it fuels that migration. Avoid pesticides, herbicides near breeding areas. Remember trees will offer shade in hot spells and a place for night roosting. And finally, I'm going to end this with this last migration map that was just released recently by Thursis that probably offers a better indication uh, to date of monarch movement, not only in the entire United States, but also in the West. Um, I hope this has helped provide some information for you. I am looking forward to some of your uh, questions or anything I could provide you with. There we go. Great. Well, thank you so much, Gail. Um, this is a topic of great interest to a lot of people right now, um, monarch conservation being a hot topic and especially um, a lot of questions about the role of the Southwest um, for the monarch. So you definitely gave us some, some good information, which I'm sure is new to many people, as well as some really practical tips on, on things uh, to focus on when, when trying to do things, uh, conservation actions to benefit monarchs. So thank you so much. And yes, I, I did want to say this is contact information, links to our paper. If anyone is interested in tagging um, or any additional questions after we leave this format uh, and providing that information for you as well. Okay, thank you. It, and I think we have time for questions. Um, want to go ahead and thank Gail so much for that great presentation and all of you for making time to be here. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, make sure you've got the participants list highlighted so you can see that in your WebEx screen. And then at the bottom of that, there's a button that says raise hand. So if you have a question, go ahead and press that button. And Gail is going to uh, scan her list and uh, call on folks who've raised their hand. You'll need to press uh, star six when Gail calls on you so that you can unmute your line. 
Gail, do you see any hands there? Uh, here we go. Victoria. So, Victoria, press star six to unmute your line. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering if you might have nursery sources for the different types of um, milkweed plants in uh, the Phoenix. And I'm up in Globe, actually, the Globe area, but. In the Globe we area? The plant. Well, probably um, not. So it would have to be just somewhere where we could actually buy the plants so we could start, or the seeds or something. Or... Do you know on our website, on the Southwest Monarch Study website, we have a link of plant nurseries. Uh, that okay. Carry in Arizona, and and we're trying to get more in the Southwest. So uh, please feel free to access that. Email us um, if you're not able to find them. Keep in mind these fall plant sales are coming up. Boyce Thompson Arboretum always has a great selection, and they're not too far from you. So uh, right. Consider them. Okay. Thank you. Uh mm -hmm. Thanks, Victoria. Gail, do you see any other hands raised? Yes, I do. Just let me, here we go. Juan, Carlos, and Bravo. Juan, Carlos, press star six to unmute your line. Still there, Juan? I'm going to um, maybe try uh, taking the mute off and, and see if we can get one. Okay. The conference is now in talk mode. Hi there, can All you right. hear me? Yes, is that one, Carlos? Yes, it's me. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, and sorry for that. Um, no worries. Uh, Gail, you mentioned grazing as one of the threats to monarch butterflies. Can you delve a little deeper into that? Can you I missed the beginning more? of your question. Do you mind repeating that for me? Yes, you mentioned grazing as one of the threats that monarchs are facing, and I'd like uh, for you to provide us with more information about that. Do you know, there's a, I'm glad you brought that up because we didn't really have time to cover that. Um, in some parts of Arizona, milkweed is removed in areas that are open to grazing uh, by the request of the ranchers. And it's a sensitivity issue knowing that this is a source of income, uh, grazing their cattle, raising their cattle, and uh, they are concerned about the toxicity of milkweed that they uh, encounter. Uh, Xersus has done some wonderful background studies on this that are available online. Uh, and I know it has been our observation. Uh, we tag monarchs frequently in cattle fields. Uh, cattle will chew around milkweed, all right? They don't like the bitter taste, uh, so it makes it very easy for monitoring. But there have been indications in drought areas when there's nothing else left and cattle are free range by ingesting it, they can become very ill. So more studies need to be done. Thank you. Uh -huh. Julie? Can you all hear me? Did I do Julie, I, I, I think you have your hand raised for a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay. You're, you're on. Sorry, I was having button issues. So I was wondering with your with the new map that depicts southern New Mexico as um, a, a, a possibly important and involved part of of monarch habitat. Uh, are there specific areas or specific individuals that are um, helping with this Southwest Monarch study in the New Mexico portion? Julie, I'd be happy to share that with you. I could email those, the contacts that we have in that area. Most of them are in the uh, northern part of the state, but we do have some in the south, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Okay, 
Yeah, great, great. And in terms of um, areas or habitats, is there anything that re that stands out in southern New Mexico there? Is that all I you know? So you're going to email me? <laughs> yeah, I think okay. I have to do the area. I think what I would recommend to you in general, we're looking for riparian areas. Almost all public land has some area that is, has either a natural sea creek or ephemeral stream. Uh, that seasonally some water will run through, if nothing else, during the monsoons. Right. Um, and are looking for those natural dips where rainwater will accumulate and try to uh, focus on those areas. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks. And, and folks, um, I took the mute off um, since we were having a few issues with that. So your lines are are live, um, so please be quiet in the background there. Um, but Gail, do you have any um, other hands raised there that you can see? No, I don't. And I'm just looking at the chat screen real quick here. All right. Well, does anyone else? We'll open it up then. Does anyone else have any questions? Go ahead and speak up. This is Chris Randall. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Gail. Um, I'm curious about the, the tagging. Um, I think that would be really valuable in increasing our understanding of monarchs and in particular to what, what's happening in Arizona. Um, how, how can we um, get uh, help out with, with doing tagging and, and information that we're, we, can, we can gather and, and, and provide that to you? Um, the information of how to tag, if anyone is curious about that, is actually on our website, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have if, if any of that is unclear. Uh, you help us create a better website in the process. Tags are available for free. Uh, just email us, and we'll provide them for you. Uh, what we are asking is that data is sent in to us frequently in case that someone along the way cites that monarch so we can let you know uh, where it's been seen. Um, any way anyone can tag it always helps for two reasons. Not only because it benefits us by seeing where the monarchs are and you get a close encounter with monarchs, but also we have learned that people who tag are more aware of the environment and they start spotting monarchs in other areas when they're traveling, when they're on a business trip, when uh, they're just visiting family. Um, and so it raises awareness everywhere. Uh, so any way, anyone can tag. Uh, if we can, we will offer uh, training sessions as to how to do that. I believe Wendy Caldwell will be up in Las Vegas in the next month or two uh, offering a training. Um, uh, so any way we can do that, we're happy to support that. We need more information. And keep in mind, in Arizona, the information we have started small. And look where we are today. That can happen in each of the Southwest states. We'd love to train uh, core people in each, in each area to do so. Uh, this is Victoria. I was wondering if you are working with any of the state uh, Department of Transportation uh, agencies to, you know, educate them as far as including um, milkweeds in their plant mixtures along roadsides and that type of thing. That is a great question. We actually met with the Arizona Department of Transportation many years ago with their environmental committee and made a presentation then. Um, and others in the state have worked with them also. Uh, just last week we were contacted by one of the nurseries who grows uh, plants for them uh, to see if we can help them locate some milkweed seeds so they can start uh, adding them in uh, to roadside areas. Uh, we provided the state with uh, key milkweeds at each elevation. Um, and oftentimes they're trying to add them into areas uh, of new improved roads rather than going back in the roads that they existingly have. Uh, but that is an ideal thing to be happening across all the Southwest. Keep in mind the thing that piggybacks with that is adjusting roadside mowing. Uh, I was just up in the Eager area to an area that does have that seals the roadside. Uh, we've monitored the site for eight years and we've walked into it mowed totally down this last weekend. 
Uh, and so, uh, again, we need to enlighten everyone about timing of roadside uh, mowing uh, by elevation as well. Great. That's a good point. Well, folks, we are out of time, um, but you have Gail's contact information there on the screen, um, and she has uh, pointed you to the website for more information, and I would, like, would very much like to hear from, from you if you have any thoughts on the website or, or questions that you can't get answered there. So I want to thank everyone very much for participating today, and especially thank Gail for making the time to be with us. Um, it was an excellent webinar. And as a reminder, uh, this webinar was recorded and is going to be made available on our YouTube channel. You can find that um, uh, from the Desert LCC website, or you can search for Desert LCC YouTube, and uh, it'll pop up near the top there. Uh, should be posted um, within a week or so. So once again, thanks, everyone, and we hope you have a great day.